you have that uh, board, Jesumati Nandana? Yeah. Okay, we can. These are all beautiful names of Krishna from Sri Vrindavan Dham. You just put it in front of the. Yeah, just temporarily. Right here. Just put it in front of the. Yeah, just put it. Yeah. Well, this is a beautiful song, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, one of his favorite bhajans. And when he was leaving the world, mm. he asked for two particular bhajans to be sung. And this was one of them. The other one was Sri Rupa Manjari. So this is a... It's just the names of Krishna. Do we have a Madanga player here? Somewhere? We lost Mr. Subal. He is. Oh, there he is. Okay, Mudanga. Can you all see the board? Can everyone see the the, the board? So Mati Nandana Braja Badan Hagaha Yasomati Nandana Braja Badan Hagaha Kokul Ranjanakana That's one melody, but I think nobody knows that melody, so we'll sing the other one. Yaso mati nandana braja varana gara kukula hanjana aha hanha yaso. Gopi Parandandanam Madhanam Manoharam Gopi Aliya Dhamma Navita Hamala Harina Amiya Vilasa Hamala Harina Amiya Vilasa Vipin of Purandara, Navin and Nagara Bada, Bumsi Vadana Su, Aha Hansa. Hey, 
Vajajan of Palan, Surakulan, Harsan. Vajajan of Palan, Surakulan, Harsan. Hantal good under Aku. Yes, 
Sumati Nandana Braja Bharanaga Gokula Ranjana Kanai Kanai Kyai Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Reading from Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 10, Chapter 49, Akura's Mission in Hastinapur, and verse, this is the verses today. Hmm? 14 and 15. Hmm. Okay. Let's see. So okay. Sri Sukho Uvacha. Ityanu smritya swajanam Krishnam cha jagat ishwaram Paruda dukita rajan Bhavatam pratita mahi Sri Sukha Uvacha Ityanu smritya jan swajanam Krishnam cha jaga ishvaram Aruda duhita rajan Bhavatam pahitamahi Sri Sukha Uvacha Ityanu Smritya Swajanam Krishnam Cha Jaga Ishwaram Paruda Dukkita Rajan Bhavatam Bhavitam Mahi Ladies, mm -hmm.
Sri Sukha Uvacha, <clears throat> Sri Sukha Dev Goswami said, E.T., as expressed in these words, Anusmritya, remembering Svajanam, her own relatives, Krishnam, Krishna, Cha, and Jagat of the universe, Ishwaram, the Supreme Lord, Prarudat, she cried loudly, Dukita, unhappy, Rajan, O King, Parikshit, Bhavatam, of your good self, Pratita Mahi, the great grandmother. Translation Sukadev Goswami said, thus meditating on her family members and also on Krishna, the Lord of the universe, your great grandmother Kunti Devi began to cry out in grief, O King. So here, Sukadev Goswami is narrating how the distress. Kunti Devi is being felt towards her sons, and that is that Kunti Devi is referred to as the great grandmother, and that is of Maharaj Parikshit. Samadukha suro shuro vidurasya mahayasa satvayam masutam kutim tadputro patiti pati he to bihi. Both the Kura, who shared Queen Kunti's distress and happiness, and the illustrious Vidura consoled the queen by reminding her of her extraordinary ways her son had taken birth. <laughs> her son's short purport. Mm. Akura and Vidura reminded Queen Kunti that her sons were born of heavenly demigods and thus could not be vanquished like ordinary mortals. In fact, an extraordinary victory awaited this most pious family. So I'm going to read on a little bit. The ardent affection King Dhritarashtra felt for his sons had made him act unjustly towards the Pandavas. Just before leaving, Akur approached the king, who was seated among his friends and supporters, and related to him the message that his relatives, Lord Krishna and Lord Brahma, had sent out of friendships. So we're hearing how Dhritarashtra, because of his attachment to his sons, were exploiting and mistreating the Pandavas, who were actually also his family members. Akura approached the king and then related a message that Lord Krishna and Balaram had sent out a feelings of friendship. Akura said, My dear son Vichitavirya, O enhancer of the Kuru's glory, your brother Pandu Having passed away, you have now assumed the royal throne. Purport. Akrua was speaking ironically, since the young sons of Pandu should have actually been occupying the throne. Upon the death of Pandu, they were too young to immediately govern and so were put into Dhritarashtra's care. But now sufficient time has passed and their legitimate rights should have been Recognized. Omagyan timirandas yagena jena salakaya chaksun militam yena tasmai shri gurvena maha dama om vishnu padaya krishna prastaya bhutale shri makti bhakti vedanta swami tinamine namaste saraswati deve gauravani pacharine nirvisesa sunyavari pastyat yade satarine 
Panchakalpa, Thiru Vishya, Kripa, Sindhu, Vecha, Patitanam, Bhavane, Bhyo, Vaishnava, Bhyo, Namaho, Namaha. Jai Sri Krishna, Chaitanya, Prabhu, Nityananda, Sri Advaita, Gadadara, Sri Vasudhi, Gaur, Bhakti, Vrinda. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Rama. Hare. Hmm. So here, we're hearing how the Pandavas are being mistreated by their uncle, Dhritarashtra. Although they were the heirs to the throne, because actually Pandu was supposed to be the next king, but Pandu had died. And therefore, uh, the Dhritarashtra was supposed to take the throne, but Dhritarashtra was blind. I mean, you can't have a king who was blind taking the throne. <laughs> We cannot govern in that capacity. So now he allowed his sons to take the position because he felt that since he was the next heir, although he wasn't uh, qualified to govern, he was thinking his sons should get the position. And so he intrigued in that way and usurped the throne. But actually, the throne was meant for the Pandavas because the rightful heir were they were because they were the sons of Pandu, who was the actual heir to the throne. But due to his intrigue, he arranged for his own sons to take the throne. And that was the basis of the whole cause of the Kuru, Battle of Kurukshetra. The Pandavas, headed by King Yudhisthir, or Yudhisthir, who was meant to be the king, and this was Krishna's desire, because Krishna wanted saintly rule. Although Dhritarashtra was saintly, somehow or other he became, what we say, poisoned, or you may say influenced by family affection. And his sons, headed by Duryodhana and Dushashana, were quite nefarious. They were not so, what we say, inclined to religious principles. They were more eager to get the position for their own satisfaction, their own aggrandizement. And this is what you see today in today's world. The leaders in today's society don't represent the people. They represent a small vested interest of very highly rich people who are trying to uh, control the world through various economic and political means. So people today are disenfranchised and are always being exploited by high taxes, high, high uh, prices for everything. So we see this the same intrigue is there when, in years ago when Dieter Astra, although he knew, and he also knew that Krishna wanted the Pandavas to take the throne, simply he went against that. And being in being the what we say, the king, not actually with power, but in disciplic rule. In other words, because he was the brother of Pandu, he took the position, although he didn't have the, the capacity to rule. So he gave it to his sons. So he's thinking, I can't rule, let my sons rule. But his, his sons were not qualified to rule. And therefore, that led to the whole battle of Kurukshetra. And therefore, Krishna took the sides of the Pandavas. Krishna actually tried to ameliorate the whole situation by speaking to Diodhana. He came to Diodhana one time, and he explained that, all right, if you want to rule, simply give the Pandavas um, five villages to rule. They are Kshatriyas, and they have to rule. So actually, Krishna presented a compromise proposal to Diodhana. But Diodhana, being very nefarious and very envious of the Pandavas, he made that statement, which is a famous statement we all hear, I will not give them enough land to put a head of a pin on. <laughs> and when Krishna understood that, then there was nothing else to do but and then, what he tried to do, he sent his guards to come and arrest Krishna. But Krishna manifested his universal form, and the guards went flying in different directions. <laughs> so 
So he even tried to, he actually in one sense knew that Krishna was the Supreme Lord, but he even went, and I says, you think, think about this. He knows that God is there, but still, he's so envious and so evil and so avaricious for his own personal gain that he can't even acknowledge the presence or the importance of worshiping and serving the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And therefore, he goes against God. Even today, people go against God. People are, they make policies to somehow push out God. They uh, say there is no God. They perform various types of rituals in order to get some material benefits, thinking that this is a success of life, rather than worshiping the Lord, who is the source of all success and benefits that anyone can get. One who worships the Lord is always in the best position. Always, one will always be happy, and one will always have whatever they need to live nicely and happily. But because of this enviousness towards the Supreme Lord or towards his devotees of the Lord, people cannot accept that. And therefore, you find so many problems in the world based on this uh, denial of the position of the Lord and the importance of worshiping the Lord. So here, now it's interesting, um, Dhritarashtra is physically blind. And so that is given, but then it's also mentioned that he was blind in a second way. He couldn't understand what was the, the truth. Although here we see, what is it? Um, uh, Udav, Akura. Akura went to the king and explained and said that, you know, Lord Krishna and Bhavaru have sent out their friendship to you. And Pandu has passed away and now you have assumed the royal throne. But he is speaking uh, facetiously. He's saying, you have assumed the ro a royal throne. In other words, you stole it. <laughs> He's kind of indicating in a very indirect way that you're, you're a rascal. <laughs> you stole the throne. It's not meant for your rule. It's meant for the rule of the Pandavas. And this is the desire of the Lord. And Krishna, Balaram, yeah, they're your well-wishers. So you will, you will benefit from them only when you acqu acquiesce or acknowledge what Krishna wants. Krishna wants the Pandavas to rule the throne and they're the rightful heir. So there's nothing illegal about Krishna's desire, but vested interests become so strong. We see that even in Krishna consciousness. Devotees, they know what's right, but they can't do it. <laughs> Have you ever had that experience? You know that what you're about to do is not the right thing, or what you should do, you can't do. What is that called? It's called Ridaya Ludabya, which means weakness of heart. Knowing that this is wrong, or knowing that this is right, I can't, I shouldn't do this, or I should do this, but still can't do it. How do you get over that? You get over that by two things, by chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, which will strengthen your mind and help you to get a taste for the happiness of devotional service. But the second thing is to serve Vaishnavas. When we serve the devotees of the Lord, we render great service to the Lord because the Lord says, one who says he's my servant is not my servant. But one who serves said he is my servant of my devotee, he is actually my servant. So one who wants to, wants to serve the Lord in the best way serves the Lord by serving the Lord's devotees. This is the essence of Krishna consciousness. Now use that word with emphasis, essence, because Vaishnav seva is higher than Krishna seva. <laughs> we might say, wow, how is that possible? But that's Krishna's desire. We use the example just like Prabhupada would use the example. You have a very important man. He has a lot of wealth, he has position, he has power, he has influence, he has followers. So what can you give him? 
But if somehow or other you show some affection or you please his one of someone he loves, then he's inclined towards you. Because of you might give his son or someone he's connected with, you do something for them and that person's pleased. That big man is inclined, oh, he's, he pleased, he's pleased. So the devotees of the Lord are very dear to the Lord. So when we serve the devotees of the Lord, especially the spiritual master, or any, any devotee actually, we're actually serving the Lord in the best possible way. So that is Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's formula, Vaishnav Seva, Jiva Doya. Jiva Doya is also serving Vaishnavas, serving the devotees, I'm sorry, serving the non-devotees by making them devotees. That is called Vaishnav Jiva Doya. That means showing mercy to the non-devotees by giving them a chance to come towards Krishna. Vaishnav Seva means thinking of ways how to serve the Vaishnavas. Just like we have our What's her name here? Hmm. Let's see if I can remember. <laughs> Tell me your name again. I forgot. When I'm tired, I can't remember you. Leela Munjari, right? Yeah, okay. So she sends me every day, every day, a quote from Srila Prabhupada on Prabhupada's statements about chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. So uh, she started doing that a couple of years ago. She does it every day. And then I send these quotes out to some of my devotees through WhatsApp. So five, at least five people every day get a quote about Prabhupada's chanting. And sometimes devotees write me back, oh, that was nice, I just what, needed, just what I needed to hear. This is what I'm struggling with. Thank you. And so I say, it's not me. It's Leela Mundari. It's, she did it. <laughs> so here's an example of how you, just by sending a, a quote, it becomes a benefit to someone spiritually, and they take it up, and then they, they improve their Krishna consciousness. An example, I was just using that as an example of Vaishnava Seva. That's one way. Of course, there are a hundred ways to thousands of ways to serve the Vaishnavas. And of course, chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, Namruchi, getting a taste for chanting. But you won't get a taste for chanting unless you serve the Vaishnavas. It doesn't happen. Our chanting will never develop beyond a certain level of, unless we actually focus on how to serve the Vaishnavas. That becomes the feature of Krishna's pleasure. And when we please Krishna, then he reveals himself more and more through his holy name. Because Krishna's name is Krishna. Abhinna Twam Nami Nami No. Krishna's name is Krishna. There's no difference between the name and Krishna. So therefore, Krishna can reveal his name to his devotee or he can restrict his revelations. He can... But if he's pleased with a devotee by the way they serve other devotees or by the way they are humbly chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, then Krishna reveals himself more and more. Otherwise, sometimes we could chant for a hundred thousand births and we get nothing because Krishna is not pleased. <laughs> so the whole, the whole thing is to try to please Krishna. And here's one way. So you'll see, I mean, uh, Dhritarashtra, I mean, Krishna has affection for Dhritarashtra because Dhritarashtra is in a family position higher than Krishna. He is the nephew of, of Dhritarashtra. Well, he's a cousin brother. He's Dhritarashtra's um, Vasudev is the son of Ugrasena, right? And Ugrasena is the, let's see, he is, well, he was a king of Mathura. So there is some relationship, I can't remember the exact family connection, but there's a relationship between Krishna and Dhritarashtra. And Krishna honors him in that relationship because when Krishna came into this world, he played the part of the role he was in, just like his and Kunti was his aunt. And so she would speak and glorify him as the Supreme Personality of Godhead, but he would touch her feet. 
when she would offer prayers to Krishna, Krishna would touch her feet <laughs> because he was her nephew <laughs> and therefore he respected her in that family matter. So it's one of the qualities of a Vaishnava, they give respect to elders according to the relationships. And Krishna was teaching that, but he was also, he enjoys doing that. Not only does he teach it, but he enjoys performing these, these acts. So back to Dhritarashtra, he's, um, he can't get it. <laughs> Somehow, you'll see as this, as it goes on, uh, it goes on and on, he's, he, it takes him a while, but finally he wakes up. He only wakes up after the battle of Kurukshetra when all of his sons are killed and there's nothing left. It took, it took him to lose everything until he finally woke up from his ignorance. And then he realized that, you know, that my sons were wrong. And I was wrong in supporting one's son's son. But this is so how strong family attachment is. This is how strong family attachment is. Prabhupada used to say, he would say, when I preach in India, it's very hard for the, the young men to come and become devotees because of the family attachments are so strong. But when I preach in the Western countries, the family attachments are not so strong. Therefore, people join my movement faster. <laughs> that was back in the early days. And so, yeah, so Prabhupada was using that as an indication of how family, you know, family attachment can be good if it's directed towards Krishna, but if it's directed towards uh, fulfilling one's desires separately from Krishna, then it creates a mentality that this is more important than Krishna. Creates the mentality because our real family is Krishna <laughs> and Krishna's devotees. We may not see that, but the devotees are our real family. Why? Because Krishna is our grandfather and Srila Prabhupada's our father, and Prabhupada's disciples are our uncles, and all the devotees are our brothers and sisters, and that's the spiritual family. And therefore, when we stay within the spiritual family and work together to support each other, as family members do, generally that's the position of family members, they give support to others in their role as family members, then we make fast advancement in devotional service. And uh, Krishna is pleased like that. But Dhritarashtra, he's a pinprick, and he can't seem to understand the importance of honoring Krishna's desire to put the Pandavas on the throne, the attachment. And he knows what's right, but he can't do it. <laughs> Again, that point we made earlier, when someone knows what's right, just like you see in the secular world, I travel through airports, and you come sometimes to these shops you have to walk through. And you see these cigarette boxes, and on the side of the cigarette boxes it says, smoking kills. And they used to say, you know, smoking is not good for your health. But then they stopped putting that on. Then they put, smoking causes birth defects, emphysema, lung cancer. And now they stopped that. Now they put, smoking kills. And still people smoke. Attachment. Attachment is so strong that people will act even against their best interests and think that that attachment is more important. <laughs> so how do we overcome these material attachments? We have to become attached to Krishna. <laughs> we have to become attached to serving Krishna by serving his devotees. When we do that, then our material attachments start to reduce and our spiritual consciousness starts to awaken. So we chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra and that's important. But the most supportive thing is our mood of service. 
How are we serving? What is the mood of service? That is the most important thing because it enhances our chanting and it awakens our connection with Krishna. So devotees should understand that we have to get attached to Krishna. That's the most important thing. Krishna Mata, Krishna Pita, Krishna Dana Pran. Krishna is your father. They always say that, right? He's the Supreme Father. Krishna is your mother because he's also your provider. And the family, the mother is the provider. She provides, the father is the supplier, the mother is the provider, right? That's how, ideally, anyway, the families do work. <laughs> and therefore, Krishna, he's not only the father, but he's also the mother because he's both the provider and the supplier. <laughs> he's giving everything. It says in the Bhagavad Gita, everything comes from him. He says that, Maya dakshena prakriti suyate sucharacharam hetunan nikunteya vijagar viva vipartante. Everything comes from Krishna. Everything. Nothing is separate from Krishna. Everything is coming from Krishna. Everything is supplied by Krishna according to your qualifications. And everything ultimately is controlled by Krishna. I mean, when you understand that, you're free. <laughs> you're free. When you, see, when you see anything separate from Krishna, you're in Maya. There's no separate, nothing is separate from Krishna. There's Krishna and his energy. His energy works under his control. And he, that's that verse we just quoted. So his energy works. Parasya shakti vihaya suyate svabhaviki jnana bhakriya All his energies work according to his desire. And he doesn't have to do anything. All he has to do is desire and the energies work accordingly. But they're working automatically by his will. But if he wants the energies to work differently or to show um, some particular, if he wants something to happen outside of his automatical energies working, then he simply thinks and then the energies move in that direction to fulfill his desire. Prabhupada, Prabhupada used to say, Krishna can make the whole world Krishna consciousness overnight. <laughs> he could, but it, that's not how he operates. He wants the devotees to do it because then they get the credit and then they go back home, back to God. <laughs> so yeah, this is how Krishna wants to glorify his devotees. So he empowers his devotees by his own power and his own will to do what he wants, but everything is controlled and everything is successful when we take shelter of Krishna. Yeah. But if we see anything separate from Krishna, then we are seeing what we say, we're seeing without seeing. In other words, the eyes can see, but if the eyes have cataracts or the vision is deficient, then you need glasses in order to see and to enhance the, the external environment so you can see better. So in the same way, if we see everything in relationship to Krishna, then everything is clear. <laughs> and Krishna says that also in the Bhagavad Gita. When you thus learn the truth, you'll know that all living beings are my parts and parcels. They're in me and they're mine. But even beyond that, even his external energy is working automatically. He puts the external energy in place and he, le he gives it the rules and regulations for working and people take advantage of that external energy individually and therefore it works against the, their own benefit. But if they take that external energy and use it, like if you use everything Krishna gives you in Krishna's service, that object becomes a source of happiness for you an op opportunity to connect with Krishna via that object, and Krishna gives you more. <laughs> right, Sunil? You use your money for Krishna, Krishna gives you more money. You use your time for Krishna, Krishna gives you more time. You use your intelligence for Krishna, Krishna gives you more intelligence. You use your energy for Krishna, Krishna gives you more energy. Whatever you, you use your cooking abilities for Krishna, he teaches you how to do more preparations. 
<laughs> in other words, whatever you use for the Lord is not lost. It doesn't like, oh, I'm using for this. It's just like if you have, if you have something material and you give it away, then it becomes less. But if you, whatever you use for Krishna, and it becomes more. Because it's his energy anyway. And he simply reciprocates by giving you a more and more opportunities to use the same thing or other things in his service. But the real benefit is that it connects you with Krishna. That's the benefit. Whenever we use in Krishna's service, then it becomes spiritualized. That's the difference between material and spiritual. Everything is, everything is spiritual, but when it's used for one's selfish interest or separate from Krishna, that is called material. And spiritual means to say, take the same energy and use it for Krishna's service. That is spiritual. Okay, so Dhritarashtra can't seem to get it. He'll get it later on. But it'll take him a lot of hard lessons to learn. So don't be like Dhritarashtra. Surrender to Krishna. Don't waste time. Because you have to surrender to Krishna anyway. Because everything is controlled and owned by Krishna. And, he can, and everything belongs to Krishna anyway. So whatever. So don't have him take things away from you as time goes on. Just give him. There's an old, there's a story where one man, he's sitting in uh, his little shop. This is in India, and he's outside. He's got his grains on his table. And a big wind comes up and blows all his grains up in the air. And he says, my dear Lord, please accept my offering. Hare Krishna. <laughs> You can't give it once it's taken away. <laughs> so don't have Krishna do that. <laughs> Use everything you have, your intelligence, time, energy, resources in Krishna's service, and you will be happy. <laughs> Guaranteed. Because Krishna doesn't want these things, but he wants your devotion. And by using them, he will be, he will, he, he, he bestows his mercy on his devotees. Okay, so any questions, comments? Yes, Lochan. Uh, uh, we always say um, we have to, you know, move out the way and let Krishna take over. Um, what does that moving out of the way mean? What does yeah, that mean? that's what I mean. Yeah, what, what is that moving out of the way? And, you know, what is our part? You know, moving out of the way is, is to think, I know what's, I know what's right. <laughs> the quality of knowledge is the more you learn, the more you realize how little you know. <laughs> that's one of the qualities of knowledge. The more you learn, the more you realize how little you know. So they say in the Christian tradition, let go and let God, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how do you do that? It's simply done by prayer, that's all. My dear Lord, please engage me in your service, that's all. Be willing to accept Krishna's mercy in the form of service. Because service, you know, it means we're, u that we're using some of our time, our intelligence, our energy for Krishna. So we're giving back what Krishna has given us. That's all. Most of us think, you know, well, you know, there's something for me and there's something for God, right? That's how we think, right? Yeah, Krishna is cool. I should give him a lot, but, you know, not everything, you know, because he's got everything anyway. He doesn't need it. <laughs> but that causes us to act wrongly. And therefore, 
So learning how to surrender, that art is taught by the spiritual master. He teaches you. But the prayer is, uh, my dear Lord, how can I serve you? Ask that to your spiritual master. Ask, ask that to the temple authorities. Ask for service. Be willing to eagerly serve whenever you get a chance to serve. That's all. Take care of your body. We have to do that. We have to take care. We have to eat. We have to rest. We have to do, take, make sure our health is intact. Yeah, those things are required. But could, that can also be done in the service of the Lord. Because we understand that this body is not my body. Krishna has given this body to me through my parents. It's his body anyway. So let me take care of it for his service. Not for my sense gratification. <laughs> and you can always increase. If you're chanting so many rounds, you can chant more rounds. If you're doing so much service, you can think how to make the service better. You can think how to do the service more. These are different ways that we can offer more to Krishna. When we have a choice to do something material or go to the temple and do something spiritual, what do we choose? Just think of different ways you can serve the Lord. And the Lord will also help you. If you pray to him, he'll help you understand how to serve, how to increase your Krishna consciousness. But you should understand it's a gradual process. If you try to surrender everything at once, you may do that temporarily, but you might not be ready for that. So stay in the process, but realize that the goal is to surrender everything, but follow the process carefully. And look for opportunities to give more, to spend more time like that. To chant better rounds, to read the scriptures with greater understanding. Quality is also influenced by quantity. When we put more quantity into something, we can also fine-tune fine -tune the quality of what we're doing also. And associate with devotees. <laughs> That's important. Ma, uh, Sunil? Mm -hmm. Well, as you mentioned in the purple, Prabhupada mentioned that Dutrast didn't take care of his nephews, Pandavas. So a question comes that Dutrast was actually the son of Vyasadeva, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he's got two good sons, Pandava and Vidura. How did he get sons like like this? Yodin. So that's one question. The second option is the second thing is that he's always had a good company of Vidura. Hmm? He had always associated with Vidura. He had a good company of Vidura. Still, he didn't change. <laughs> and then the third is he was seeing Krishna. Still, he's not changed. So what kind of a heart he has got? <laughs> The impossible question. I mean, for for most of us, we would think uh, that's enough for you know for for all that's all I need. All this, uh, the Krishna's there, you know, Krishna's pure devotee is talking to me all the time, Vidura. And uh, my father was, you know, the author of the Vedas. <laughs> And his wife, Gandhari, mm -hmm. she was chaste. Mm -hmm. I mean, she was considered one of the chaste ladies in the history of Vaishnavas. Well, it reminds me of the one story. 
Krishna at the end of the, I mean, Dhritarashtra at the end of the battle of Kurukshetra came to Krishna and said, Krishna, you know, I had a hundred sons, they were all killed, and I was born blind. Can you tell me my karma? And Krishna said, yeah, 50 lives ago, this is in the Mahabharata, 50 lives ago, you were a hunter and you shot a flaming arrow into a nest of birds and there were a hundred birds in the nest and they all died. And But the mother were, bird got away, she was blinded by the fire. So, after hearing that, and he understood his karma. And then he also said, well, why 50 lives? And Krishna told him that karma works in such a way that, uh, just like we use an example, if you have a debt and you don't have the money to pay it, and then they wait until you get the money, and then when the money is there, then you can pay the debt. So he didn't have enough good karma to produce a hundred sons. So it took him 50 lives to build that karma up. So he had a lot of good karma. And when all of that was in place, and then his karma crashed, <laughs> in other words, collected. So, yeah, there was things in his previous lives that caused him to act wrongly. And these things can also appear in the lives of a devotee. Sometimes we see even devotees who have the best situation, they go away after some time, for whatever reason. The attachments we have in the material world are sometimes so deep-rooted and that they have been there for so many lives, and therefore, and of course, we take births according to those attachments too. <laughs> so yeah, and there was obviously something in his past that was very strong, that manifested at a certain time. But you'll see. I mean, if you read the Bhagavatam, you go on. Ultimately, he got liberation. Dhritarashtra. Yeah. When, but it took him, it took him, everything had to be taken away from him, except his wife. Shkandari remained with him. And both of them, they went to the forest and they left their bodies and they actually attained liberation. Because there was one good thing about his, uh, his situation is Vidura never let up on him. There were, even though he couldn't understand or accept what Vidura was saying, Vidura didn't give up on him. Sometimes when we preach to someone, we say, hey, come on, can't you get it? I mean, I'm, trying, I'm telling you what, this is the best thing. And uh, the person doesn't get it or doesn't want to get it for whatever reason. And then the guru says, oh, why waste my time? But Vidura wasn't like that. He loved his older brother, and therefore he kept going, despite uh, Dita Rasa's refusal to accept. I mean, he called them names. <laughs> he says, you're like a household dog, <laughs> right? You're living at the remnants of Bhima, who you tried to kill, right? Because at the end, he was living at the expense of the Pandavas. And he, they were, he, they were, he treated them as their enemy, but they didn't treat him as the enemy. And so when he needed shelter at the end, they gave him shelter. But Vidura said, you're just like a dog. <laughs> you're sitting for scraps of food coming from the table of Bhima, who you tried to kill. <laughs> and so Vidura was, I mean, he was heavy. <laughs> but he never, but his heaviness was full of his compassion. And eventually he got it. He, he left everything and went to the forest and attained liberation. So it took him a long time. <laughs> Let's hope we're not like Peter Rost. <laughs> Subal. Thank you, Samaras. Um, you mentioned in the class about 
devotees, when they know that they're not doing the right thing, but they still do it uh, at times. Well, you mean, you, you, in reference also to Dhritarashtra, knowing, Dhritarashtra knowing the right thing, but still not able to do, and you mentioned you attach that to a weakness of heart. Right. And that's one thing, but I was thinking, sometimes we think we're doing the right thing, and we're convinced we're doing the right thing, but it's not the right thing. So that's a very difficult uh, situation when somehow or other there's a rationalization of doing something that you make yourself believe that it's right, but, yeah. but the results and every, every symptom is that it's not well, right. Well, if you remain without the association of devotees, you'll stay in that mentality. But as soon as you take association of devotees, they'll let you know this is not the right thing. <laughs> One way or the other, either directly or indirectly, that association will reveal that this is, this is not right. But if you don't take association, then you'll go on with your illusion. And then when things become so bad, then you realize, oh, I did the wrong thing. But that's why, that's why sadhu sangha is so important. Very important. Mm -hmm. yeah. Even if it's difficult, stay in the association of devotees. Because you'll benefit, no doubt. Mm -hmm. That difficulty is just your false ego being challenged, that's all. <laughs> But if you want to stay in association with devotees, the best way is to be in the mood of serving devotees. Because when you're in the mood of service, it becomes nice. If you're in the mood of getting, you may get something, but, but then you may not be always eager for that association. Look for opportunities to serve. That's all. Yeah, so that's the antidote for that kind of mentality. Why do we have laws or rules to check, to inhibit, to restrict, to guide? These are the, these are the rule, things that laws and rules do. I mean, if you... If you're driving on the road, say you're from India and you come to America and you're driving on the left side of the road and you say, you get pulled over by the police, you say, well, I'm from India, we drive on this side. <laughs> he said, sorry, sir, here's your ticket. <laughs> you broke the rules. So the laws and the law enforcers are there to help us to understand what is right and what is wrong. Same way, in the association of devotees, we get clarity on what is how to properly act. Does that make sense? Okay, just okay. Anyone else? Mm -hmm. What time is it? I, mean, I can't see that clock. Huh? 8.40? 840. Okay. I guess we're supposed to end at 8.45. So thank you very much. Srimad Bhagavatam ki jai. Srila Prabhupada ki jai. Hare Krishna.